The Wizard of Oz. In the forest. After a few hours, the road began to get very rough. Sometimes, indeed, the yellow bricks were broken or missing altogether, leaving holes that Toto jumped across and Dorothy walked around. As for the scarecrow, he just stepped right into the holes and fell full length on the hard bricks. Each time he laughed merrily while Dorothy lifted him onto his feet again. <laughs> Those hard bricks can't hurt my straw, <laughs> he said after his first fall. The only thing that can hurt me is a lighted match. <laughs> no, do let me carry that basket for you. With Toto leading the way, they walked on through countryside which became increasingly bleak. Towards evening, they entered a great forest, where the trees grew so big and close together that their branches met over the road and shut out the light. They stumbled along in the darkness, until Dorothy could hardly walk another step. At last they came to a little wooden cottage. It was completely deserted, but it had a bed of dried leaves on which Dorothy and Toto soon fell into a sound sleep. The scarecrow, who was never tired, stood and waited patiently for the morning. When Dorothy woke, the sun was shining into the cottage. She felt very thirsty, so she and her friends left the cottage and wandered through the trees until they came to a rippling brook. Here Dorothy washed, and she and Toto had their breakfast of water and bread. The scarecrow did not eat anything because, as he explained, he was never hungry. They were about to return to the road of yellow brick when Dorothy was startled by a loud groan. <coughs> what was that? I cannot imagine, said the Scarecrow, but we can go and see. They walked a few steps, and then Dorothy gave out a gasp of surprise. <gasps> One of the big trees had been partly chopped through, and standing beside it with an uplifted axe in his hands was a man made entirely of tin. He stood perfectly still, as if he couldn't move at all. Did you groan? asked Dorothy. Yes, I did, answered the tin man. I've been groaning for more than a year, and no one has ever heard me before or come to help me. What can we do for you? Oh, my joints. Oh, they are so rusted that I cannot move at all. If I am well oiled, I shall soon be all right again. You will find an oil can on a shelf in my cottage. Dorothy ran to fetch the oil can. Then, with the help of the scarecrow, she oiled the tin man's neck, arms and legs. He sighed with satisfaction as he slowly lowered his axe. Oh, 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 thank you. I am extremely grateful. Oh, I have been holding that axe in the air ever since I rusted, and I might have stood there forever if you had not come along. So you have certainly saved my life. How did you happen to be here? We're on our way to the Emerald City to see the great Wizard of Oz. I want him to send me back to Kansas, and the Scarecrow wants him to put some brains into his head. The Tin Man thought deeply for a moment. Hmm. Hmm. Do you suppose the Wizard of Oz could... Give me a heart? If he can give the scarecrow brains, I don't see why he can't give you a heart. Yes, said the scarecrow. Come 
come with us to the Emerald City. We will be pleased to have your company. So the Tin Man asked Dorothy to put the oil can in her basket in case he should get caught in the rain and rust. Then he shouldered his axe and led the party through the trees to the road of yellow brick. Dorothy now noticed that there was hardly a bird singing in the forest. But there was an occasional deep growl from some wild animal hidden among the trees, and her heart began to beat fast. Do not be afraid, said the Tin Man. The mark of a good witch's kiss on your forehead will protect you from harm. Just as he spoke, there was a terrible roar and the next moment a great lion bounded onto the road. With one blow of his paw, he sent the scarecrow spinning over and over to the edge of the road. Then he struck at the tin man with his sharp claws and knocked him to the ground. Little Toto ran barking towards the lion. The huge beast opened his mouth to bite the dog, but Dorothy rushed forward and slapped him hard on the nose. Don't you dare bite Toto, she cried. You are to be ashamed of yourself. A big beast like you biting a poor little dog? I did not bite him, said the lion, rubbing his nose with his paw. No, but you were going to. You're nothing but a, a big coward. I know it, said the lion, hanging his head in shame. It is my great sorrow and makes my life very... Unhappy. If the elephants and the tigers and the bears ever tried to fight me, I should run away. I'm such a coward. But they all think of me as king of the beasts, and I only have to roar to make them all run away from me. He wiped a tear from his eye with the tip of his tail and sighed. Oh, if I only had courage. Perhaps the great wizard of Oz can help you, said Dorothy. We are all on our way to visit him in the Emerald City. The Scarecrow is going to ask him for brains and the Tin Man for a heart. You could ask him for courage. Then, if you do not mind, I will go with you, said the lion. You'll be very welcome, for you'll help to keep away the other wild beasts. So once more, the little company set off, the lion walking with stately strides at Dorothy's side. They had gone some distance, when Dorothy noticed the Tin Man brushing tears from his face. I stepped on a beetle <laughs> and killed the poor little thing, he explained. I, I must keep my eyes on the road and walk more carefully. <laughs> People with no heart should try not to be cruel or unkind to anything. Soon after this, they began to hear strange growling noises among the trees. I fear we are in the country of the Kalidars, whispered the lion. They are monstrous beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers and with claws so long and sharp they could tear me in two as easily as I could kill Toto. Dorothy shuddered and was about to speak when suddenly they came to a broad, deep chasm. The friends looked at each other in dismay and then sat down to consider what they should do. I think I have the answer, the Scarecrow said finally. Here is a great tree standing close to the chasm. If the Tin Man chops it down so that it will fall to the other side, we can walk 
across it. That is our first great idea, said the lion. One would almost suspect you had brains in your head instead of straw. The tin man set to work at once, and so sharp was his axe that they soon had a bridge. They were just about to cross the bridge when, to their horror, they heard a sharp growl and saw two great beasts running towards them. Oh, they are the Kalidors, said the lion, beginning to tremble. Quick, cried the scarecrow. We must get across the bridge. Dorothy went first, holding Toto in her arms. The tin man followed, and the scarecrow came next. The lion turned to face the Kalidars and gave so terrible a roar that for a brief moment they hesitated. But then they rushed forward again. The lion crossed over the bridge and looked back to see what the fierce beasts would do next. Without stopping, they too began to cross. Stand close behind me, said the lion to Dorothy. I will fight them as long as there is breath in my body. Don't despair, called the scarecrow. If the tin man can chop away our end of the bridge, we will all be saved. The tin man began to use his axe at once, and just as the two Kalidars were nearly across, the tree fell with a crash into the chasm, carrying the snarling beasts with it. The lion gave out a huge sigh of relief. Oh, my heart is still pounding with fear. Ah, said the tin man sadly. I wish I had a heart to beat. This adventure made the travelers more anxious than ever to get out of the forest. They began to walk so fast that Dorothy and Toto became very tired, and as darkness began to fall, they had to ride on the lion's back.